This episode of Making a Chef is brought to you by Broadcast Media Group is a full-service production company with a team of storytellers who create commercials, promos, web-based videos, and more. For more information about Broadcast Media Group, go to www.getbmg.com or call 662-324-2489. Video Magic One transfers home videos, tapes, and photos into DVD, CD, or digital files. For more information, go to www.videomagicone.com or call 662-320-9344. Today, we're in downtown Meridian at the Mississippi Arts and Entertainment Experience. President Mark Tolis is going to show us around and talk to us about Mississippi food culture. I cannot wait to see what's inside. You must be Mark. Yes, and you must be Mark. Thank yes, you for coming. We're delighted you're here. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. Well, this is a brand new museum. We call it the Mississippi Arts and Entertainment Experience because we celebrate all the artists, the musicians, the authors, and even the culinary chefs that came out of Mississippi. So they're ours too. This is awesome. The, the bright light, the natural lighting, the blue colors, even all boils down to you know the detail in the photos. Really seems like a place I can get behind and enjoy. Well, you've just got the first impression. We're going to go upstairs and see some of the places many of these great artists got their start. Yes, sir. Sounds awesome. Tell me a little bit how the Max got started. You know, nothing great like this happens without volunteers. So a group of volunteers throughout the state have worked tirelessly for the past 20 years to not only raise money, but to build a vision for what this needed to be. And we're thankful to all those volunteers in Mississippi who gave us guidance. Mm -hmm. And then after we started preparing for the construction of the museum, we ne still needed money. Mm -hmm. and so we asked the people of Meridian to pass a 2% prepared food and beverage tax. And so they passed that. And so this building in part is due to the private contributions of people and then the 2% prepared food and beverage tax. It's very impressive. You brought the community together and they rallied around this place and they made it a reality. So what type of exhibits do y'all have in here? You'll find here a church exhibition because a lot of artists got their start in the church, mm -hmm. in music. Some people got their start in the juke joint, playing late night yeah. in, in the bars. So we have a juke joint here. And then we have the home, because the home's very important to bringing up young artists. But what's really amazing is people really love this kitchen that we're sitting in. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of culinary artists, like yourself, got their start in their mother's kitchen. I started off you know, helping my mom. She always cooks dinner, and I would not be where I am without uh, working in the kitchen. And that's the kind of inspiration we try to share with other young people. That's part of the, what the museum's here for, primarily an educational place. So we want people to learn. Speaking of learning, you know, I was over here just reading. I know Chef Nick Wallace, I've done a couple events with him. So just reading his bio, one of his favorite things to cook with is pollen. And now that I know that, I have to ask him. Ask what you, him. Yeah, what do you use pollen for? And ask him if his guests sneeze over their dinner. <laughs> I saw his thing, I wonder who people with allergies, how that would deal with them. The important part of this place is you come here and you learn about artists and what made them artists and then you can take away from that, you know, you bring all that home with you. Downtown Reading is changing, it's becoming beautiful and I could definitely tell the Max has something to do with that. Yeah, what's important to note is we've been open under a year now and we already have restaurants popping up in downtown Meridian. That's because tourists are coming down here and they're looking for they, uh, they like chain restaurants, but they also like locally owned restaurants. Yeah. Cultural tourism is about eating local and local chefs, and we have one of the greats here in Meridian at Weidman's, which is just across the street from the museum. So you can see how you can make a day of visiting the museum and then going to eat at Weidman's and then coming back. I actually think I'm going to meet with Chef later today and see if he'll teach me a couple things. I mean, I'm really looking forward to that. You're in for a treat.
I'm with Chef Mason from Wyman's Restaurant. He's gonna run me down on their special and awesome smoked salmon. Chef Mason, thanks for being here. Happy to be here. Tell me a little bit yourself, please. Uh, I'm local, born and raised in Meridian, Mississippi. Grew up in DeKalb, Mississippi, 30 minutes down the road. I have family on the coast, so I have an influence of you know coastal food plus good old country cooking, as they call it. That's about it. I've been cooking for at Weidman's going on four years. I graduated culinary school here locally at MCC, and I love what I do. My dad also grew up here in Meridian, and my mom's from the coast, and so we have similar influences there. I see here we have, you know, bread, we have fresh vegetables, we, and then we also over here have salmon. So can you run me through this dish, please? All right, what we have here is a, uh, a rustic, I guess you would call it a baguette. Mm -hmm. We toast it off in a panini press, get a good crunch on it, so yeah. you get some good texture. And we'll start off with a little bit of homemade pesto. Homemade. And what we do with pesto, instead of using pine nuts, we use pecans, because we're in Mississippi. We're yeah, that's in Mississippi. awesome. Give it a good spread on there, good, good coverage. Okay. Take a nice piece of smoked salmon right there on top of it. And we'll do a few capers. Okay. Add a little flavor to it. Some chopped red onion. Mm. And that's it. That's the whole dish? That's the whole dish. That we, is extremely simple. It is very simple, but it is so tasty. Why don't you uh, give me a hand? So you said you make your pesto at pecans. What other kind of you know local produce ingredients do y'all use at Widen's? We try to use as much local as possible. Uh, here in the South, we get a lot of good fresh vegetables. We do, I mean, climate's perfect for yeah. it. So we try to use as much as possible. To me, I, I just feel better cooking with it because, you know, I have a sense of peace knowing that, you know, what I'm eating did not travel, you know, 2,000 miles exactly. on a truck. It, it came from, you know. It helped the guy down the street. Exactly, at most two miles away in some instances. And that's what I love about cooking local. We just about done. Uh, so you said you have six to a plate? Yes, six to a plate. So if my math is right, that is yes. six. So show me how y'all put this up, please, once y'all ready. Take a plate, we lay it out. Twist oh, the lemon. The lemon. Yeah. A little twist the lemon and, of course, parsley. parsley to garnish. I mean, make it pretty. And that's it. All right, let's go. Mm. You know, you can really taste the smokiness of the salmon. Get a little bit of bitterness and uh, freshness from the capers and red onions. And then the bread just provides structure. A little texture. Exactly, oh, and the so pesto good. just brings a smooth and creaminess to the end of it, and it is a very complete dish. So I also hear you'll have a very famous 1870 sauce. We do. Any anyway, you can show me that? Yeah, absolutely. All right, Chef, so this is a wide range of ingredients. This is going to be our 1870 sauce. It's kind of an homage to the history of Weidman's being here since 1870. It, it goes over top of our fried green tomatoes. It's cool. uh, a lot of ingredients, but it's yeah. very, very good. I'm ready to get cooking if you are. Yeah, let's get going. Let's do this. Get that cranked up, a little butter in the pan. Get that melting. Butter makes everything better. Oh, yeah. And then we'll toss in some uh, our Mardi Gras mix. You want to start off with the Mardi Gras first mm -hmm. and mushrooms. This is also uh, not your classic take on fried green tomatoes. A lot of people no, just take not. fried green tomatoes, you know, a glass of sweet tea or a glass of Coke. Get all that good and soft. Need a little bit more butter. Butter never hurts anything. Absolutely not. Fat is flavor. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Ooh, got a good smell going. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll add our shrimp in. We usually do four shrimp, depending on size. We do a 31 40 count, so they're yeah, nice. good medium size. Mm -hmm. Take a little bit of garlic, put it in there, get a good background on it. You know, one of my opinions, a lot of people love garlic as like a main flavor. I much prefer it as a background. Oh, yeah, because it can overpower a dish yeah. really fast. You can just about ruin one. Yeah, exactly. What we'll do is we'll add our Alfredo in. That's Alfredo? That is Alfredo. It's, that now is, we do a, a in-house Alfredo and it is thicker than most. That so is incredibly thick. What right we here. do is we'll thin it out with a little cream. Ooh, yeah. Now you're talking my type of cooking. <laughs> oh, it gets a little messy. Uh-huh. Yeah, we'll you can really start to smell the color that you get on top of those vegetables. It's, it's 
starting to really smell yeah, good. Yeah, it'll come together here in just a second when we put this uh, this red sauce, what we call a red sauce, which is a tomato tomato sauce with uh, sauteed garlic in it. Still getting a little more garlic. Do you make this in-house, tomato sauce? We do, we do, sure do. Of course, you need a little salt and pepper in salt every pepper, dish, and uh, our house-made Creole. Now, can you tell me anything about that Creole seasoning, or is that kind of a secret? <laughs> it's a little bit of a secret. Okay. Everybody's got to have some secret. Yeah, I agree. Now, once you're done, this is pretty much done. It's your, done? Your shrimp's firmed up nice and tight. Wow. Add some Parmesan to bring it all together. I love Parmesan cheese. It's probably my favorite type of cheese, and I don't really like cheese a whole lot. And it adds a little bit of saltiness to yeah. it, too. So. That is totally not what I was expecting <laughs> when I read 1870 sauce, but, you know, that looks good. It is. Oh, it's wonderful. You want to go ahead and plate it up? Sure, yeah. We'll pour it right over top of there. Ooh. Ooh, Good and that looks amazing right there. And that's it. That is our 1870. That's it? That's how it will look if you order it at our restaurant. That's how it comes out. You know, if you know how to fry green tomatoes and you know how to work a pan, that is a actually really simple dish. It is. It is. It looks complex. Uh -huh. and it looks a little overwhelming at first, yeah. but honestly, it's, it's pretty simple to make. Now let's try it. Let's try it. Okay. Yeah. So like you said, this is a very overwhelming dish. So how do you <laughs> go about eating it? Oh, you just got to dig into it. Take just a little, in. little bit of fried grain, okay. sauce, get a little mushroom, maybe a shrimp in there. Mmm, they're so good. Mm. And you can see the depth of flavor from all those ingredients. That is very good. You know, like you said, the depth of flavor. We have, we have the Alfredo. We have the red sauce. We have. I can even taste the Cajun seasoning. And then all on top of that fried green tomatoes. Perfect platform. It is a truly, you know, well balanced and amazing dish. Uh, how about we go over to the restaurant? Awesome, I'd love to see that. Take a look at the rest of it. So Mr. Charles, this is an awesome restaurant. Great fried green tomatoes, 1870 sauce. I had y'all shrimp and grits. I was struggling to stay awake, it was so good. Tell me a little bit about the restaurant, how it kind of influences uh, food culture, not only in Meridian, but in Mississippi as a whole. Sure. Well, we've been here since 1870, so we're the oldest established restaurant in Mississippi. We were established by a Swiss immigrant, yep. Felix Weidman. It was in the Weidman family until 1999 when the last vestiges kind of sold out to a group of investors, 56 of them. And that kind of gives you an indication wow. of, of how the community has always embraced this restaurant and how there's a, a sense of community ownership with that. I came in in 2010, and uh, we've been open eight years under this kind of version of Weidman's. So all of my knowledge of the history and, and the, the kind of culture of Wyman's has been given to me by people who remember it, the version they had when they were growing up. So before our food got there, I noticed we had a big old crock of peanut butter. The peanut butter, that's kind of an interesting story. The legend is that during World War II, there was a butter shortage. Mm -hmm. And then one of our regular customers told the owner at that time, we should just put peanut butter out on the tables. It kind of became a tradition and people love it. Yeah. Kids love it, but even adults too. We've talked to a lot of the community as far as what the old recipes they had, um, you know, the ambiance, the pictures on the wall, everything like that. And we've really tried to bring back as much of that as we could, but still kind of putting our own stamp on it. So it has our own identity, but also that of the past. So if you can describe Weidman's, how would you describe it? I'd say in a nutshell, just classic Southern cuisine. It's an important component of this community. Meridian, oh, that, that's got that place, Wiedemann's, or, you know, all, <laughs> yeah. all kinds of different pronunciations. I, you know, we don't mind what you call it as long as you know we're here. And certainly that's a testament to the Weidman family because they created this thing. It's a special place and it's really an honor to be a part of it. I always like to go to the big restaurant in town and experience their food, experience their culture. I feel like Weidman's is a great example that this is, you know, Meridian food culture is being revitalized. It's mixing the old and the new together and having you know, like I said, an awesome product. Definitely, I agree with you 100%. I'm gonna put you on TV. It'll be a commercial for us. <laughs> yeah. No, I appreciate that, that's great. I just wanna thank you and Chef Mason for allowing me to come here and teach me a couple different things. Can't wait to go back to my kitchen and take what I learned here, make some awesome dishes with it. Right, well it's been an honor having you. It's been an honor to meet you. I think you got a great future ahead of you. Thank you. You got it. Imagine this, it's a hot summer day. The kids are going crazy, it's about 100 degrees out. They're begging for something cold, delicious and refreshing. What are you gonna do? Call over Dr. Brent Fountain, who's a registered <laughs> dietitian at Mississippi State University, and have him teach us how to make this awesome cucumber soup. So Dr. Brent, 
Mark, thanks for having me back. So yeah, we're gonna do a chilled cucumber soup. Now a lot of times when you think soup, you're thinking hearty, you're thinking hot, yeah. and this is actually a cold chilled soup. So I think you're gonna have a lot of fun with this recipe. Okay. Now, very simple in the ingredients. Like you said, we've got some dill here, we've got some salt and pepper, got some garlic, we've got yogurt, and it's just plain yogurt. You could use Greek yogurt if you wanted to. And then we've got the main ingredient, and that's the cucumbers. If you read the recipe, it talks about seedless cucumbers. You could use a regular cucumber. Your blender's gonna blend it up just fine and it's gonna make it really smooth. Now, we're actually using two cucumbers and you notice that they're a little bit different. Uh-huh, yeah, this one's lighter color and this one's darker That's color. That's right, and why is that? Probably because you peeled them? I did. We wanna peel one because we do wanna keep some of the skin there. The greatest amount of nutrients is right beneath the skin. Of course, it also helps with consistency and texture. Yeah. So we're gonna leave it on this one. Okay. We've gone ahead and peeled one. So if you'll go ahead and place those in there, we're actually gonna blend these first. Very nice. And as we add more ingredients, that'll blend the rest of that around. Yeah. All right, so let's go ahead now and cut up the dill. Okay. We're gonna mince this dill up, just a good fine dice on it. You really just want the flowers on the end. Little bit of stem is good, but these longer stems, you just wanna kinda yeah. break off and get rid of. You know, if you have the chance, fresh dill is definitely better to use more flavors to it. It smells better. As we break this apart, you can even just smell mm -hmm. the dill is just kind of just permeating the room, which is really cool. Chop it up. But how much dill are we looking for? So I would say somewhere between a half a cup to a cup would be just fine there. Okay, just pour it in. Just pour it in. We've got two teaspoons of salt and one teaspoon of pepper. Okay. So you can go ahead and add those in. And now we're gonna add two cloves of garlic. Bust them out of their skins. Two, get that going. So the last ingredient, we've got, I believe, four cups of yogurt right here okay. that we're gonna add in. I think the recipe originally called for six cups, but we pretty much are doing about two thirds of this recipe. Okay, mix this all Mix that up. in. You see the little specks in there from the peel. Mm, when you get, yeah, amazing. it smells good, doesn't it? So when you got it ready, what you do now is you return it to the refrigerator, okay. let it cool until you're ready to serve it because you do want to serve it chilled. The soup is chilled. We garnish it with a little bit of leftover skin that we grated off and I can't wait to try it. Yeah. So, ready to dig in? I'll let you try first. That's very good. Mm -hmm. If it was me, I'd add a little lemon juice or a little lime juice to kind of bring a little acidity to the party and back off the salt just a tad, but. I can definitely see if you made this the night before and let it sit, perfect. Perfect, and I agree with you. It's probably, this is probably a little bit too much salt. Again, you could also add a little bit more yogurt to yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And with the Greek yogurt, it's probably gonna give it a little bit more acidity to it as well. But you can imagine on a hot summer day, mm -hmm. coming in from lunch and enjoying that with a BLT or something yeah, like that. definitely, perfect. definitely. Chris is refreshing. I can't wait to make this this summer with some homegrown cucumbers. Thank you, Dr. Brent, amazing recipe. Mark, thank you very much for having me. I had such a great time at Weidman's Grill and the Max, learning all about Mississippi's rich culinary history. They were so nice and decided to invite me back to do a cooking demo when they opened up the Jim Henson exhibit. In honor of one of Jim Henson's most popular characters, the Swedish chef, I'm gonna make Swedish meatballs. To start off the Swedish meatballs, I'm gonna make a panade, which is just milk-soaked bread. So I have some day-old bread or so. You can let it stale if you want. It'll soak up the milk better. This is the base. This is what's gonna help keep liquid in it. Now, what makes Swedish meatballs different from Italian meatballs is pretty much three things. One, the spices. In Italian meatballs, they use more herbs. They use basil, oregano, and thyme. In Swedish meatballs, we use spices like cloves, allspice, nutmeg even ginger, and so it gives a completely different flavor profile. Another difference between Swedish meatballs is the sauce. Swedish meatballs are covered in a brown gravy similar to what you might have with, you know, a sausage gravy. The last difference is a little more visual. The size is more of like a tablespoon compared to, you know, two or three tablespoons of Italian meatballs. I think that was enough bread, so I'm gonna cover it with about a quarter cup of milk. I don't know why we use milk instead of, you know, water or stock. I don't question classics. I'm gonna set this to the side. Start on our base. It all starts off with one onion, minced pretty finely. 
And while I'm gonna start that, I'm gonna go ahead and put my pan on medium low heat with a little bit of olive oil in there just to start warming it up. Now this is where the waterworks start. I'm gonna make three or four horizontal cuts, not cutting quite through the whole onion, unlike what I just did. Then I'm gonna flip the onion 90 degrees and make 10 to 12 vertical cuts. Again, not cutting all the way through the onion. Flip it another 90 degrees and mince. I'm gonna use half an onion or so. We have our onion. So turn up the heat a little more, throw around your olive oil and add half an onion into the pan. I'm trying to impart as much flavor and as much meatiness into this meatball as I can, since they are very, very small. If you can brown your vegetables, colors flavor. Now that the onions are on the heat, I'm gonna let these cook for about five minutes until they have a little color on them. It's been about five minutes, our onions starting to get a little color on them, so I'm gonna mince up these two mushrooms. Now, this is not exactly classic Swedish meatballs. I was thinking, I want to part as much flavor as I can in these little ones and make it a total umami bomb when you bite into them. Umami is the sixth flavor, which is basically a meat flavor, as best I can describe it. We're going to continue to let these cook for another two to three minutes until they have a nice color on them and all the moisture has evaporated out. Okay, these have a nice color on them. There's not much moisture left, so I'm going to turn off the heat and let these cool. I'm going to start assembling the meatballs in the bowl of a stand mixer. I have half a pound of pork, pound of ground beef. This is my you know, favorite combo. I like the meatiness of the beef and just the extra flavor the pork brings is always a plus. I add our bread in with any remaining milk. And here's our spice mix. It's a teaspoon each of salt, pepper, cloves, and I'm gonna grate in a teaspoon of nutmeg. It also has a half a teaspoon of ginger. Now, remember how I was saying to boost your umami? Well, this right here is dried mushrooms. They're very, very full of umami. They taste very meaty. I'm gonna grate them in. I'm really trying not to grate off my fingers. That's a no-go for me. I use half or so of a mushroom. Mm, smells really meaty. I'm gonna beat this till it's just combined for maybe a minute, then I'm gonna add the eggs. Close it, lock it, and beat it on medium, medium low, okay? It's starting to become one homogenous mixture. Now I'm gonna add two egg yolks. And again, beat it for a minute or so on medium low. This is good for me, so I'm gonna drop the paddle in there, take the bowl out, put it in the fridge for about an hour just so it all cool down and become more homogenous. The meatballs have been chilling for about an hour. Now I'm gonna whip them up and wake them up. I should put that on an apron, whip them up and wake them up. I have my grandmother's electric skillet preheating to 300 degrees. I use electric skillet just because it's more even all across. I'm gonna start forming the meatballs as soon as it's up to temperature, then throw them in this pan and keep them warm in the oven. Oh yeah, it's hot. So I'm gonna grab about a tablespoon or so. Try not to have them touching each other, but you can have them kind of close. I'm gonna go ahead and add them to the pan. Some of them might not be cooked all the way, but again, we have a 250 degree oven to finish cooking them, and they're gonna be covered in a warm gravy. Now, it's time to form a second batch. Okay, these are done cooking. So, while I'm making the sauce, I'm gonna put these in a 250 degree oven just to continue cooking some of them. I'm starting with a base of Espanola sauce. All it is is a roux thickened sauce that just uses beef stock. To that, I'm gonna add a tablespoon or so, a hefty tablespoon of grape jelly. Now, I'm using this to add a little bit of flavor and so they'll stick better to the meatballs. Okay, that's just about all melted in. I'm gonna add half a cup or so of cream. Mmm, that is very, very good. I'm gonna let this boil up for a few minutes. The sauce is looking delicious, so I'm gonna pull out the meatballs. Now it's time to pour the sauce on these meatballs. Okay, last little bits that are out of there. We're gonna mix these all up. That's my rendition on Swedish meatballs. You add lots of great spices, you mix it up, let it all chill, and make an amazing sauce to go over top. 
And I think this might make the Swedish chef proud. I'm gonna take these and we're gonna go to the max. We just finished up the demo and the Swedish meatballs were an awesome hit. I just want to thank everyone at the Max for having me. I can't wait till I come back. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe and check us out on Facebook and Instagram.